Day of Atonement in general, and it dealt with Old Testament scriptures. This beginning class is going to be the new, the Day of Atonement in general, New Testament. <clears throat> and we're just going to go over some scriptures, and then hopefully we should be able to proceed to the garments, <clears throat> at least uh, in general. Because we're, this is the first couple of classes, so we're just hitting everything in general right now. All right, turn with me if you would. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8. <clears throat> I want to lay the groundwork <clears throat> for the Old Testament and the things that we've studied and will study, <clears throat> realizing that however great the Old Covenant was, the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement, <clears throat> It was all just a shadow. It was all only a, a faint picture of what was coming and of what Christ would fulfill and of what he would be the fulfillment of. Uh, I make that distinction, wrote a book on it, uh, where I alluded to the fact of Christ as the fulfillment and as the fulfiller, <clears throat> certain things he fulfilled prophecy, but, but meant most of it, he was the fulfillment of it <clears throat> himself. All right, he, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Speaking of the Old Testament priests who serve unto the example and shadow of, of the heavenly things, who, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, saith God, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. <clears throat> all right. So this clearly is a scripture that shows that the tabernacle and everything they did <clears throat> was a shadow and a picture and of the heavenly realities. Um, also, flip over to the ninth chapter of Hebrews. Or, I'm sorry, let's, let's uh, yeah, let's go to 9, 9, 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews 9, 12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves... But by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. <clears throat> All right, several things to notice here. One is, this is speaking of the New Testament, the New Covenant. Clearly, it says he entered in once into the holy place, meaning that he accomplished everything and was the fulfillment of all the times that that high priest, whoever he was, never the real high priest, none of them, always shadow high priests until Jesus came. There's the one, Jesus. There's the man, Jesus. There's the fulfillment, Jesus. There's where you're going to find life. There's where you can study the old covenant you can spend all your time <clears throat> knowing the Old Testament scriptures about the tabernacle and about the priests and about all this stuff. You can do all that. And if you don't see Christ for, as the fulfillment of all of that, <clears throat> then, then you know a whole lot about shadows. But you don't know him. And you don't know what gives life to everything. You don't know that without him, those things have no life in them. They have no life. And, and to learn them is purposeless. Now, I say that because I know people who study the tabernacle and the priesthood and the offerings. <clears throat> My God, they know more than I'd ever know. 
on it. But my goal is not to know everything there is to know in these areas. My goal is, <clears throat> and you'll, I'll, my goal is to know Jesus. And you'll notice, and maybe you don't notice, but when I teach, when I teach uh, what is a New Testament priest, uh, uh, sacrifices and offerings, now Day of Atonement and feast, <clears throat> I don't teach everything that's in those subjects around, you know, that I don't, I don't cover everything. You know what I share? I share what the Lord has shown me of himself, and that's all. So, so I conveniently skip over. You know, if you didn't know it, you'd go, wow, he knows a lot. He covers a lot. But in truth, I skip over a lot of material because you know why? I haven't seen Jesus in every area of every aspect of the tabernacle. But where I have seen him, where he is life, that's what I want to share. Why? Because <clears throat> I don't want to just talk. I don't want to just talk. I want to know Jesus. I don't want to just talk to you and teach you just to learn Bible facts alone. Now, you have to know the Bible facts. But just to know Bible facts alone. You learn Bible facts because you have a heart to know Jesus. You search the scriptures because Jesus said, there's where you're going to find him as life. That's why you, that's why you read the Bible. That's why you search the scriptures. That, that's your purpose. It's never, 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 never to become a scholar. The only scholars I see, even in the New Testament, were, were Pharisee-like. Paul was not a scholar. Paul had a passion for the Lord. And it, it never ended. It never stopped. Until the day that he died and he had his cut, head cut off for Jesus. Jesus was everything to him. And that's, that's, so that's what I want to impart. And that's what I want to be real to you. <clears throat> okay, also in verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. All right, so there's a holy place that was made with hands, the holy of holies, and this says Jesus didn't never went in there. Is that interesting? Jesus never went into the physical holy of holies that was on this earth. You, the holy of holies, so you could say it was the most holy place on earth. Yeah, there's the key word, two words, on earth. And that's what this verse says right here, figures of the true. Figures of the true. Why would Jesus go in the shadow? Never went in there. Because <clears throat> Jesus was more aware of the true than he was the shadow. We tend to be more aware of the shadow than the true. May it not be so. May it not be so. May it not be that we know more about shadows than the truth. And how will that be the case for us? <clears throat> well, we are his body. The head belongs to the body and the body to the head. All that is in Jesus, all the knowledge, all of the understanding, not of the shadows, all of the understanding of the true. He knows. He's not real familiar. He probably never, even, you know, in the past or in spirit or anything like that, you know, 10,000 years before this or whatever, he probably never walked around the Holy of Holies, never walked around the tabernacle, never said, ooh. You know, you have some churches now, folks, that are becoming more Jewish. I mean, they're doing all, they're making a Holy of Holies and they're, they're setting up, I mean, I saw this guy, I was in, in uh, Houston ministering in a church, and the pastor that had me ministering in the church asked this other pastor, 
He said, man, we got him down here, and, and I was doing the several services on Saturday, and then I had Sunday morning service with the pastor I was with, and then Sunday night. And he said, well, in between, y'all have a service, and you don't want to miss having this guy come. <clears throat> so they invited me to come teach in a church I'd never seen before. Pretty big church, a lot of people there. But before he had me teach, they went and real quickly set up this sort of tabernacle looking thing and from it took the offering. And he stood in the little holy of holies and received everybody's offerings and took their hands and prayed for them and said, God's going to bless your finances. I'm looking at this. That's, that's cloth and little sticks. Why don't we go into the true? Why don't we enter in boldly to the throne of grace? Why are we, you know, that was a, I, I'm sorry, but in light of the shadow that God made called the Ark of the Covenant, that was a really stupid looking thing, you know? Now, a lot of the people in that church had come out of Catholicism, so they were real impressed. Because, you know, rituals and stuff. I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying that, you know, they used to rituals, and so they were replacing their rituals with that. Oh, my God, I'm just looking at that and going, you know. <clears throat> so, so I got up there and, ta and taught on Jesus as being the fulfillment of all things. And I didn't do it in a bad spirit. And you know what? The pastor didn't get upset. In fact, in fact his daughter came down who had not been wholeheartedly serving the Lord and gave her life to the Lord and she said if this is the Lord then I want this Lord and told her daddy you know <clears throat> well these things are in the hands of the Lord I have you know I don't touch hearts either I, I, I apparently don't touch hearts I just throw the seed out there and hope that it find good ground you know and that's just another little point if you find seed coming up and you don't blame me, blame God. One sows, one waters, but God gives the increase. Okay? I don't give it. I, if I knew how to give the increase, we'd have more than we've got in this room right now. <clears throat> okay? I just don't know. All I know is I know Jesus. I know this is the truth. I know the truth must be shared. I don't care if it's with a small group or a large group. My life is given to sh throw the seeds that are Christ out to the hungry that really, really want him. And that's it. So I do that faithfully, and I'll do that, Lord willing, and by the grace of God to my dying day. <clears throat> All right. And also over in Hebrews uh, 13. Hebrews 13, uh, let's start at verse 11. <clears throat> For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. All right, just consider that for one moment, if you would, please. He's talking about the bodies. <clears throat> He's talking about, and, and just on the Day of Atonement, folks, there were several different bodies brought out there. Just on the Day of Atonement, not counting all the other times. The bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary, <clears throat> consider these beasts. That's what the New Testament called them. Consider these beasts. Their blood goes into the Holy of Holies. Their blood goes into the sanctuary. Their body goes outside the camp to be burned. Uh, you could say to one of those um, beasts as you're preparing to burn his body outside the camp, you seem to have a couple of things going on at the same time in, with you. Part of you is in the Holy of Holies, 
And part of you is outside the camp being burned and rejected because that's what it's going to say next. Is that possible? Well, it's not only possible. All right. <clears throat> okay. So that said now, we have the, the type. Okay. The fulfillment is going to be what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, right? Yes and yes, but there's more to it than just something that happened 2,000 years ago that we believe. That's why verse 12 comes up. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Now, verse 13, let us go forth. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Folks, what you just saw right there is part of the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And that is not just something that happened 2,000 years ago and is over with, but something that in the mind of the writer of Hebrews is still going on with his body. Still going on. <clears throat> in other words, if this were just something Jesus did, fulfilled, and finished in every aspect, he would not say, let us go unto him outside the camp bearing his reproach. He would say, let us go by faith to what he did 2,000 years ago. Am I right or wrong? I mean, just think through it for a minute. I mean, I, you know, I'm just trying to make us think about reality as we're supposed to be involved in it. I'm trying to get us beyond doctrines. I'm trying to get us beyond just that something happened 2,000 years ago and we believe about, we have belief in it. We have faith in it. I'm trying to get us to see that we are yet his body, we are yet counted with him, and we are yet going unto him because we're, the, we're one with him, we're the body of him. And that he is still being rejected at the same moment that his poured out life is being accepted. Where? In the sanctuary, in the Holy of Holies. Well, nobody, nobody's in the Holy of Holies, folks, except God and the, and the high priest. And that high priest happens to also be the son of God. Nobody knows about the acceptance of the poured out life. They only know the rejection of the burnt body. Only God knows. Only God knows. You know. <clears throat> Let me just throw a thought at you. Does it bother you to be misunderstood by somebody? Does it bother you that people would think things of you that weren't true? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> but you know what? It comes down to who you want to please. And it comes down to what is it you can, well, the thought, you can, you can please some people, but you can't please everybody. There will always be someone, always will be someone that misunderstands you, that thinks evil of you, but you know what? That's part of the deal. You got, I mean, think of the distance here between the Holy of Holies over here and then on the extreme over here outside the camp at the fire burning out there. 
Just consider that. What do you got? You, got a, you have acceptance and you have rejection. Okay? We say this. Well, I want my whole spirit, soul, and body lined up. And here's what we think with that. So that I have acceptance and acceptance. But it's never going to really work that way. I mean, you'll have seasons where everybody will like you. Just be careful because those same people will find an excuse not to like you. <clears throat> who was doing the accepting and who was doing the rejecting? God was doing the accepting in the, I'm going to say it like this, in the secret place of the Most High God. The secret place that nobody else can go into. And who is doing the rejecting? People outside that want to put that, that sin offering outside the camp. What is being accepted? The poured out life. And that's all. What is being rejected? The body of the poured out life. It's just the body. It's just the body. It's just the body. You see, and, you know, may the Lord, may the Lord uh, do more than just have this class, and you hear this right now, and then you forget it. May the Lord bring these things to your remembrance when you're in the fire. May you... May you find a way to be in the Holy of Holies at the same time. I mean, is that an amazing thing? I mean, just the concept is pretty amazing. That you could actually be with God in the Holy of Holies and in the earth burned and rejected, basically, is what that scripture is saying. It's just an amazing thing to me. It's an amazing thing. Can you imagine the, uh, the burned body beast crying out and going, why are you burning me? Why are you rejecting me? Go look in the Holy of Holies and you'll see that God has accepted my poured out life. Well, first of all, they'll never get into the Holy of Holies. They'll never get in there. They'll never see in there. The only way they're going to know is they're going to have to ask God what he accepts. You see what I'm saying? But it's a futile endeavor to try to get those who must put, put the beast outside of the camp. It's a futile endeavor to change their minds. It is. It's, it's futile. That's, that's their part. Like it or not, that's their part. Not that they're of God doing it, but it is their part, and they're fulfilling their part. You're never going to change them. All you're going to do is satisfy the Father with the poured out life of the blood. All right. So, enough on that. <clears throat> um, we're going to change course here now. We're going to move into the, uh, the garments in general. So, this gets a little difficult for naming classes because you end up overlapping stuff and <clears throat> you can't just stop after a certain amount of time. So in Exodus 28, now some of you may remember, was it last semester that I taught on the, um, what it means to be a New Testament priest and the consecration of the priest. 
It's this last semester, wasn't it? And what chapter was that? Exodus 29, the whole chapter, and that's pretty much where we were. Okay? Exodus 29. All right. We are backing up to Exodus 28 because all of this is pertinent to the Day of Atonement and the preparations and all of that that were going to come. <clears throat> all right. Uh, let's start at verse 3. Exodus 28. Thou shalt speak unto all that are wise heart, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. All right, so these, these are going to be the people, well, let me finish reading it, <clears throat> that, if, uh, that they may make Aaron, and Aaron is going to be the first high priest, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Okay, so... He's about to go over the different garments and things. But I want you to notice that he says, And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted. Wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make these garments. And if you do a real close study of this, you're going to find that there was incredibly intricate things done. I mean, for, for example, uh, they took gold and they beat it very thin into thin threads and wove it into the high priest's garments. You know, just put it in there. Just incredible work that they did. Okay? More importantly, this is speaking to those who are wise-hearted, that you may comprehend what is going on, that you may comprehend what is made, that you may comprehend the spirit, the, the spirit of wisdom. Anybody ever heard that phrase before, the spirit of wisdom? Let's see, Ephesians 1, 17. That the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and, and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So, interesting how the two placements are, one in the Old Testament, one in the New. The spirit of wisdom was used when it came to making the garments for the priests and comprehending these garments in a manner of putting your hand to it, not just seeing them and saying, oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that, you know, isn't that a good work? You know, I mean, let's put that, well, you know, Nisi's sewing right now. I've seen some fish things sewn and everything else, and, and all of that's great. But these garments were not just neat. They represented eternal things. And that's what we want to see, and that's what we want to comprehend here. So to do that, before we even truly begin to get into these garments, it's going to take the spirit of wisdom. It's going to take revelation. It's going to take more than just hearing, and so... So what I would pray for you and what you should pray is that when you enter into these classes, oh God, open my eyes to see Jesus. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him so that I can know what's going on here, not just. In other words, I want the Holy Spirit to teach me, not just to hear from man. All right, so let's just read a little more in here because we have to lay the, the groundwork again. And this, this, this portion of this class is called the garments in general. Verse um, 4, And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and an embroidered coat, a miter and a girdle. 
And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother. Aaron is who? The brother of Moses. They were literal brothers. And his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And, and those are the same words that ended the last verse that we just read. And they shall take gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. Okay? And we're going to go ahead and read through this. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and fine twined linen with skillful work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the beautifully woven girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and purple, of scarlet, and fine twined linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in settings of gold. Thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones and memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall wear their names before the Lord. Got it? The high priest shall wear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Thou shalt make settings of gold and Two chains of pure gold at the ends of braided work shalt thou make them. Fasten the braided chains to the setting. Okay, that was the description of the ephod. Now the breastplate. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with skillful work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue and purple and of scarlet, of fine twined linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be and double the span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. A span, if I remember correctly, is you take your hand like this, and that's considered a span. Is that right? Anybody know that, or is that, am I the only one who's ever, yeah, that's supposedly a span. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, where did I stop? Okay, in verse 17, And thou shalt set, set in it settings of stone, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardis, a topaz, carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a hyacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. See, there's my birthstone. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. The stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one of, with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of the braided work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. The other two ends of the two braided chains shalt thou fasten in the two settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the, breast, of the ephod before it. Okay. So we're just reading. You're going to put the chain here. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Do you remember what we read right here at the first? Speak unto all those who are wise-hearted. Is the Lord speaking? Speak unto all those who are wise-hearted. Are you filled with the spirit of wisdom? Because these things are not just boring facts. These things reveal Christ. Every word, every part has Jesus in it. All right, verse 26. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate and the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod 
underneath toward the forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the beautifully woven girdle of the, girdle of the ephah. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the beautifully woven girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon the heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. All right. Now we're going to move to uh, a sort of a strange part of the high priest thing. It's called Urim and Thummim. Urim and Thummim. And basically Urim and Thummim is sort of a mysterious thing. Uh, I won't be getting into the, the meaning of Urim and Thummim in this class. Uh, probably the most I ever taught it was about two years ago when I taught down in Mexico. And I was teaching on Aiken. And in the situation with Aiken, they called for the priest and they called for Urim and Thummim to find out who it was that had sinned. And in that session down there, I, I shared on Urim and Thummim and gave what I had seen from the Lord. So all that's mentioned here is verse 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thummim. They shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. All right, now we're going to talk about the robe. Thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be, it, be an hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of a coat of mail that is that it be not rent. And beneath, upon the hem, uh, upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. Isn't it interesting how it words these things? And we'll get into some of the meanings of these things. To see the Lord and to see that we are the body of the priest. And these things are supposed to clothe us. We're the body of the high priest. And there's, there's, we're not just supposed to walk. We say we're the body of Christ. So what that means is we're just like limbs and organs and, you know. I mean, that's kind of the only thing. And, and there's a place for that, but that's not the only. The Being the body of Christ is the primary portion of what the high priest, the body of the high priest, is clothed in. We're what's clothed. The head, yes, has a miter on it. But we're, we are what's wearing these things. All right. And then verse 35, And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness unto the Lord, or holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. That's, that's the only part that the head wears. It's called a miter. And it's telling you things about him as the head of what he bears and of what we bear. 
Now, we don't bear it as Christians. There are a lot of things we don't comprehend because we mix stuff up. We're not bearing certain things as Christians. We bear them as the body of the high priest, not even as the body of Christ, but the body of the high priest. See, we're, how can you not bleed over into what it means to be a New Testament priest? How can you not comprehend that the next chapter is going to be the consecration of the priest, which all, as we, we discovered, all happens to us, not just as his sons, but as his body. All right. And then this final part, verse 39. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the miter of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, and turbans shalt thou make for them for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place. That they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. All right. So basically that's a picture of the garments of the high priest. You say, now why are we going over the garments of the high priest? <clears throat> well, because particularly these garments are going to come into play in some of the things that I'm going to be sharing on the, that happens to the priest on the Day of Atonement. So we'll stop here and uh, take a break, and then we'll come back and really get into... Uh, specifically, well, still in general, the garments. Hmm?